So, electron. How many people have heard electron? Besides, good. How many people have used electron? All right, awesome. Hopefully, I won't put you to sleep. The rest of you, hopefully, you'll enjoy the journey. So, why am I here? Um, I have a slight mental defect. I actually like standing up here and talking to people. <laughs> um, secretly wanted to be a teacher. Then I saw teacher pay, UX software pay. Okay, uh, we know our career path. Um, I recently wrote a co-authored a book for a press with my good friend Leif Wells on Electron from beginner to pro. I actually have a copy here. We'll figure out a raffle as well. Um, it's an interesting book. We took a different approach in writing it. You actually really don't build an app in there. Because how many people have like gotten the technical books and like how many people have done the to-do app? You know, a thousand. There's real value in the to-do app. I'm not going to throw that away. But there's an issue with Electron that you'll understand as we go through of why we didn't have you build an app in there. So I'm going to teach you with that thought. Um, I'm still an Adobe Community Professional, mostly working in PhoneGap Cordova, as well as Experience Design. I am actually a UX lead for a home automation security company down in Carlsbad. So driving north wasn't so bad. It wasn't coming from downtown San Diego. Um, I have a couple courses on Linda, and I've also written a book on the Ionic framework for O'Reilly. So what is Electron? Well, it was actually released back in 2013. So we're talking it's a five-year-old system. Uh, where it's just about to hit the 2.0 release. So it's been chugging along. Um, it was actually written by uh, uh, Xing Zhao. He actually worked on another project called NWJS, Node WebKit JS, and then actually moved over. And then basically, it was the foundation for the Atom editor. So how many people use Atom? Okay. How many people use VS Code? Okay. All right. There's a reason. Those are all Electron apps. So the idea behind Electron is it's actually a blending of technologies. It's a blend of Node.js. It's a blend of Chromium, which is basically the actual engine inside of Chrome, the browser. So Chrome is the browser of all the things like bookmarks and all that. The actual web rendering engine is Chromium. These two things together are what sort of make Electron magical. I was going to do the Doug Henning thing, but I stopped. <laughs> a lot of the apps on your computer are probably built with Electron. I almost, when I do Ionic Talk, some things say like, same thing. It's like, a lot of the apps on your phone are probably actually written in PhoneGap. You don't know this. A lot of the apps probably on your computer are also now written in Electron. So obviously, Adam, GitHub, was drinking their own champagne and built the Atom editor. That was the foundation of there. VS Code, my favorite editor. Who would have thought, hey, I'm, I'm a little old, I got some grading, got a few grading. Like, would be saying, yes, I like a Microsoft product. <laughs> it's hard to say, but it is an, you know, though, actually they're both great editors. Um, you mentioned Slack. Here's another Electron based app. Uh, GitHub Desktop, another one. Postman, if you're not familiar with that, which is a great um, API remote inspector. The WordPress desktop app, and the list goes on and on. You can actually, pull up that URL and just keep scrolling. A lot of the apps you've never heard of, but it's a great solution because it allows the development community to again have that one language, that one set of tools, and now come to the desktop. It's very similar to almost like the sales pitch in, that I give about PhoneGap and Cordova. Same idea, one code base, multiple platforms. So what does Electron bring to the table? What does it give us as a desktop app building solution? Automatic updates. So in this age of agile development and always adding new features, because there are no bugs, just new features. You know, we have a way to you know, push updates to our users. Um, native menus. So if you've been doing some web app development, there are hard walls. Fine, I have this beautiful web app, but I have the Chrome menu bar the Firefox menu bar. I have to somehow fake some sort of interior menu bar that's clunky, kludgy, doesn't fully work right. Now I'm trying to hack in and override keyboard shortcuts to try to make, no, we can get that. Notifications, we have that sort of an engine. So I can say, hey, 
you know, we all use Slack. Slack notifications. Hey, you just got a new, you know, DM or whatever. Crash reporting, okay, yeah, there might be bugs. You might want to know about them. Um, <laughs> profiling, Windows installers, Mac installers, on and on. So it actually brings to the table a lot what you would need in your utility built to make a desktop app. Because most people don't write desktop apps. They're a rarer breed than, say, even like trying to find someone to write a native desktop app is harder to find than someone who like, oh, can I find a Swift developer? Can I find a, you know, a, a Java developer to do something for Android? Desktop people are a little harder. Beauty is you can ship to all three of the platforms. So I can write roughly with one code base, ship for the Mac, ship for Windows, and even ship for those penguin loving people out there in the world as well. So, and this has a lot of value, especially when you start thinking about the enterprise world, where if you, I used to work at Qualcomm, you step behind the firewall into the land of IT and all of a sudden, you know, here are hundreds of these web apps and applications to make the back end world. Oh, wait, I can start doing some stuff that I can't do and really provide some value. How does this all work? Talk about no, talk about Chromium real fast. Electron is really built upon two silos. It's built upon this main process silo, and it's built upon a renderer silo. These two processes run simultaneously. And this is probably the biggest sort of mental shift going from a web app development world into an Electron development world. Because these two friends have a way to talk to each other, but you have to explicitly tell them to. The main process, that's really where you're going to mostly interact with that node component of Electron. That's where you're going to pull in a lot of your node modules. This is what's going to allow you all the cool desktop stuff that you can't do in a browser. We can start to do some. Browsers are getting better. But if I want to talk to the file system, write to the files, launch other applications, put up native dialogues, things like that, that's going to live over in this main process, which is mostly a node. Mostly where I think of it is that's where my node stuff lives. The renderer process, this is that UI layer. This is all living in that Chromium side of the world. This is what I paint on the screen to show my users something. And those are the two parts. Now the interesting thing is, you actually don't have to have this part. You don't have to have a renderer. You can have something that's just a main process. So if you got some little batch job or something, you can actually make a headless, faceless Electron app and do something with it. So let's face it, we're software developers, we're lazy. If we can find a way to automate a process, we'll do it. And you can start do th doing things like that. You know, making your life easier. That's what it's all about. That UI layer. Mentioned it really briefly. It doesn't have one. This is actually sort of the hard part of Electron. That is a blank web canvas. Just like your web apps are, you have to make some informed decision about some framework somewhere to come up and develop a UI layer. Just like Cordova. Cordova is a blank slate. It doesn't care if you're using Framework 7, Ionic, Onsen, your own, same thing over here. So depending on what the background you have, you can pick your technology to render that UI layer. So, you know, the Angular people in the world, I live over in the Angular world, we can use Angular. If you're a React fan, boom. You want to play around with UGIS, great. Backbone, Ember, heck. You know, if you're old school, you want to go jQuery UI, you can do that. Roll your own. Heck, you can even use Ionic, which I've done. It's the real challenge. That's why we actually didn't have you build an app in our book. Because if I wrote a sample app to do an Angular, guess who I just pissed off? The React and Vue people. And if I did React people, I'm going to piss the Angular people off. So we actually just kept rather just plain, simple JavaScript. And really didn't go too deep. Because like, all right, how many times do I want to write that to-do app? And you know, try to come up with some artificial. So that's the one big challenge with Electron is that UI layer. 
what are you going to pick? Because what you do in Electron isn't necessarily that hard. Set up menu, some dialogues, some things like that. It's still the hard engine is the business logic, the UI side. That's where the sort of the challenge of Electron development comes in. So installing it. Heck, everything's NPM. <laughs> Boom, drop it. Real simple. Now, they have a little quick little get starting. And this is actually the command. And actually, we'll hop out and do a little more demos in a minute. Basically, clone their starter. Has a few things. And change the directory. Reset the git flags. NPM start. Boom, you got your initial Electron app. And it looks really sexy. <laughs> you know, hello world. Um, but there's some interesting stuff that actually goes on. If you actually will walk through the gets here, we'll do it up here. So you literally have six files. Six files basically, and then the, the node modules, start and create my desktop application. And even less, because you know, who cares about the license? We always forget which one do we want, you know, do we want MIT, whatever. We have an index.html, a couple JSON files, and a package JSON. That's the start. Now in reality, you're probably gonna start, you know having directories and making things a little nicer. You know, you're probably going to start putting everything inside of an app folder. You're going to have a build folder, a disk folder, things of that nature. The git ignore. So the main JS. So the main JS file, this is what Electron's going to point to. Well, by default, the package JSON points to main.js. If you want to change convention, you can't. But it's main.js. This initial JavaScript file is what Electron is going to boot up from. And the nice thing is, since we're living on top of some modern stuff, we can actually start to write in a little more modern fashion. Now, we're going to be writing the main JS in JS. The renderer side, you know, if you want to live over in the, in the land of TypeScript or something else, you can do that. But over here, you're basically running ES6. Basically, pull in Electron. We define a browser window. Do things like path, URL. Eventually, we're going to call and create a window. We say, hey, make me a new window. I want it this high, this wide. Tell it what to load up in there. Not a lot to it to get started. Now, remember, it's Chromium. So all those skills you have, like that Chrome DevTools, we have it built in. It's there for us. So everything that you kind of gotten used to working with as part of that muscle memory of figuring out starts to be there. Now, unfortunately, because you're moving out of the browser into a desktop app, some of the responsibilities start to move back onto you. Like, cleaning up after yourself when windows close and listening to all these other events. So some of the things you've never had to worry about before now become your responsibility. So like going from being a teenager to like a young adult, like, what do you mean I gotta pay rent and do laundry? My twins are 17, we're in that phase. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, so we have a on ready event. So all of us who have lived in the land of, you know, document ready or for Adobe developers, device ready, we got ours. Yeah. Because this is still going to take you know, a few moments to boot up and things and splash screens and you got to deal with that world. The HTML side is pretty straightforward. It's just HTML. So the nice thing is, even though we're just barely getting to 2.0 with Electron, there's lots of little minor updates, they actually keep the Chromium engine really, 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 really fresh within a day or two, and like basically, you got a new one. So whatever is getting poured into the latest version of Chromium in terms of support for new features and the evolution of you know, HTML 5.1.2, et cetera, et cetera, all the new JavaScript is available to you. And the nice thing is, you're locking that inside of your Electron app. So you know what you're going to get. You're not beholden to mismatches, so you could actually make Electron app. Even if, say, your enterprise company says, thou shall use only IE or something, you know, and there's 
it's not as bad as it was, but you know, you may be trapped in a legacy system where, heaven forbid, you know, they're still running Windows 7 or something and i11. With Electron, basically, you have a captive browser so you can use the new stuff that you want to use and makes life a whole lot easier. So that's a nice thing there. But you know, we have our script engine here, so we have another script engine also, so we can figure out processes. So this is what actually wrote that, you know, hey, what version of Chrome I'm running? Chromium, really. My version of Electron, my version of Node over there. Real exciting. And then I basically can pull in this render JS file. So Windows. So not the operating system, but the actual application window. We actually have a whole lot of parameters. So out of the box, that first one just had a width and height. We actually have a whole bunch of attributes we can set up on our window. And we're not restricted to one window. I'll show you an example. So second windows, how to make a fake splash screen sort of thing. I'll show you that. So we can say whether it's window to be shown or not. Our background color, we can restrict the width and the height to the thing. So, you know, we can only make it so small because as a UI person, there's a point where I'm like, um, yeah, I know you can shrink down the window, but I can't refactor the UI of this app to that point. I need a minimum of this. You know, it's a data table. I can't make it any smaller. Um, I can even make it not movable. So if I actually was making some sort of, you know, dashboardy thing, I could, you know, lock all these things in positions and not have anyone like muck them up. I can have it always be on top. I can change the title. Um, lots of capabilities. I can actually make frameless windows. So if I don't want the window Chrome, I don't have to have the window Chrome. I can also make my window transparent if I want it to. Um, that was a lot of fun. That was an interesting one. I don't know if anyone has used this. I don't know what it's written in, but I've seen some web measurement apps that you can fire up and it will act as overlays on top of the browser. You're trying to take screen measurements and that sort of thing. That's what you could use this potentially for. So yeah, so here's a transparent one. So yeah, there's a attribute, transparent, true. And if I wanted it to be transparent, I'd see the stuff through. This, the content in the HTML is there, but the window itself is transparent. So you can do interesting things. Mentioned this earlier, menus. This is obviously one of the big differentiators between the browser world and the desktop world. And when you launch any sort of application, you have a menu bar that has all the things that you want to do with it. Not what Chrome wants to do or Firefox wants to do. We have that capability. And this is actually what usually winds up with being the bigger blocks of code in my Electron apps because you have to define all those menu items and the structure and it becomes something about this long, 10 times longer for a fully fledged menu. So basically we tell it to build from a template, we set the application menu and away we go. What does that template look like? Well, it's basically a big, long, nested, messy JSON file. So we give it a label and the first label that's what's going across the top of the menu bar. And then the submenus are the things underneath. So then you can have submenus in there. Add infinite item, add infinite item. Now, you can update this on the fly. You can change what things are enabled. So all, everything you think you need to do with a menu, you can do. It's not a hack. Now, what's nice is they have both accelerators and rolls. Because when you're stepping into the land of the desktop world, there are lots of conventions, you know, cut, copy, paste, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need to rewrite those. They understand that those are sort of core functionality. And that's where that role comes in. So they sort of automatically handle that for you. By adding that role, they know what you want to do. Now you can't override it, so if you put that in, you're, you basically have a contract with Electron that this is how it's going to work. So if you have something custom, you're going to have to call your own function. But we can also define our accelerators. Those are the keyboard shortcuts. 
And you'll see that first one, you know, command or control. Hey, I can deliver to both platforms. Us Mac people, it's, you know, command C. The Windows folks, it's control C. It handles both of those worlds for you. It knows what OS it's running on and will adapt to that. So here's an example, screenshot of a, a menu being instantiated. So there are, you know, my modifiers up there. Here's a submenu. I have a check mark under there. All that is within my electron control. So as I'm moving things in and around, I can do all that. Contextual menus. How many people tried to do a contextual menu in their web app? One or two. Yeah, it was fun, wasn't it? You know, you're just, it was probably one of the most hackyish things you'd ever attempt, and yeah, and you still probably got Jira tickets from QA saying it didn't work. ESTJS for that. You remember, like Yeah. Yeah. So we get them as well. So this is just basically another variation of the menu element. So we can have OS proper contextual menus in our application. And we can either set them globally or on an item by item basis. So depending on what your app needs to do. So again, to the end user, they have, this is all the right set of tools. They have no idea what this is written in. So here I have a contextual menu, building it from a template. Um, Usually the contextual menus are a little simple without all the nesting in the menus. Um, custom functions right in here. And then I just set it right here to a window event listener. So this one would just, anywhere I clicked inside my application, this would show up. But, you know, if I wanted on a specific button or a specific element, you know, I just move where I attach that event listener to. And see, so, you know, we get nice things, you know, fat arrow functions. So all, all the cool things you're learning, like here at Fuse, you know, all great. This is the magic between the two worlds. So it's talking about those two silos. You got that main silo, you got the renderer silo. They don't talk to one another. Kind of like my twins. I have boy-girl twins. They don't talk much. Usually yelling. Who's emptying the dishwasher? IPC, so sort of like us, like me and my wife, we're the parents. We're communicating between these two. The IPC, this is the channel between these two processes. Because basically, these are kind of sort of segregated things. There is a way to actually call functions within each other. You can, but what I have found in talking with other developers, it tends to get a little messy, messy that way. They really do like to sort of keep UI stuff over here, really a separation of concerns and stuff that's really sort of OS-y over on the main. But a great example of where that baton handoff would be was I click on a button over here that I want to open like a save dialog. Save dialog is over in the OS side of the world. So I need to tell it, hey, go open the dialog. And then the dialog needs to tell, say, my UI, oh, here's your file path. And oh, OK, I'm done. Now do this or whatever. It's the IPC that allows us to talk back and forth. IPC actually comes in two flavors. It comes in a synchronous version, version as well as an asynchronous version. So this is the sync version. So you pull it in, and you know they're really cryptically named. IPC renderer, IPC main, usually keep them straight. Um, unless it's 2 in the morning and your chapter's due. Um, basically here, we were attaching it to a button I have on my UI, click, and then basically send synchronous this message with that. And over here, so this part right here, that's sort of the name of my token that I'm sending over. And over in the renderer, it says, hey, if I get an IPC message, with this basically as the message header, then pull these arguments and, and do this. And then I can basically send back the return value. Now it's all locked up, synchronous. We may want something asynchronous. Very type of similar. Hey, we're going to send over and then same idea. 
So depending how your UI, your interaction, because sometimes you may want to lock something up until it's done. Um, sometimes you may not, or it may run. So a great place where this gets used is actually pulling up and kicking off dialogues. So you know we have some files. We're starting to get more and more file access with our browser, but you know. The native alert dialog in a web browser is on a scale of one to ten, and what about a one? I mean, it's you know, it's funny. It's actually like one of the first things you actually show if anyone's done any Cordova work. Same thing. You pull up, you make a PhoneGap app. You have a JavaScript alert, and it says you know, index.html alert. I'm like, oh well, that's not nice. And the first thing you do is like, oh, here's again native dialog. Same thing here. How do you get a native dialog? Well, we got them. We actually have several variations of them. So we have a file open and a file save. We have a message box, which is really sort of your alert info box. We also have this special alert box. Um, sometimes the naming in GitHub kind of, I love to hit that Wayback Machine because calling these boxes, I don't fully get. I'd love to like, how that one, who lost the bet, you know. Um, an error box is something you can fire off very, 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 very fast in the start of your application if something went horribly, horribly wrong. But, but the cool ones are like the file open. So this basically is where that IPC stuff starts to come into play again. So here we have a dialog. We're going to say, hey, go open the directory dialog. Boom, go do this. And then we're going to get a nice looking file dialog. We have a lot of opportunities with the open. So we can actually filter on the file, the directory, multi-selection. If I want to be, need to be able to create a directory, so all these capabilities you would want in a desktop application are there. I can even you know, show the hidden files. It's like, oh, you know, you're writing a text editor. Oh yeah, that dot git ignore that you actually need to go edit, I can show that to you because it's hidden. Um, and actually, there's a nice thing on Windows. We can actually prompt create. So here's a little more. Here's a save, you know, hide extension. A lot of the things are all there for us. So message boxes, these are really dialog boxes in my world. Um, very similar, except now we start to define our buttons, who's default, what the cancel is. Because remember, as you start moving in the desktop world, you have to you know, really do think about keyboard interaction, accessibility, those sorts of things. So when I hit you know, escape to cancel, who am I talking to? What am I working with? Message in detail. There are four variations. So an info, an error, a question, and a none. On the Mac side, they're all the same. There, are really, there is no visual difference between them. Windows actually does something with those variations. So depending on my type, you know, I can get different icons in there and have different little bit of elements of how they lay out. Now you are not bound to the default icons. You can actually have your own custom icon, your own custom image. So basically we have a, a module in there called native image. Tell it where our little icon is. And then we can just pass that in as an icon. So, you know, your visual designers crafted a beautiful application icon, and then you can plop the, the warning triangle on the corner and make it look nice and pretty. Or something else. Now, I was talking earlier that that UI layer was all about Chromium. We have all of these web content events that we can listen to and hook into and start to do something with. So depending on what your application needs to do, you know, did the cursor change? Should I do something? Um, the, if the dev tools were open, do something. Um, did I fail to load? Did I, you know, media started playing? Plugin crashed. Uh, you can actually run Flash inside there, just, just so you know if you actually needed to. Um, you know, will navigate all these things. These are all events and things that you can start to listen into if your application needs to work with them. 
All right, let's talk about some of the sad parts of the world, debugging. Because I know everyone in this room, you know, writes flawless code, but your coworkers may not. You know, how do you handle that? Well, the renderer process, actually, we have Chromium's dev tools right there for us. So we have our, our console log, we can go in, look at the HTML, why is the CSS misbehaving, what's going on, I can go at it from there. The main process actually is a little harder because this is living inside the land of Node. Um, we actually can implement and use VS Code's code tools. It's debugging to get in there. Um, and if you are a Node person, if you're familiar with Node Inspector, you can pull that in and start playing in over on that end of the world. Because those two silos are are truly silos. You know, you may be putting console logs over there, but you're not going to see them in the console log that you would see over on the renderer side. So, um, there is another extension, actually a DevTools extension called DevTron. Um, it has some interesting stuff. I used it a little bit. It didn't knock my socks off. It's kind of like, okay, it's there. Um, but it. The only thing I would say is it does help a little bit on some of the IPC communication. This stuff going back and forth. Because it's really that one part of the world where you're living in two worlds at the same time. All right, how many people test? Right, unit tests? Should more hands, more hands? Fix that. Um, I'm a prototyper. A friend of mine wrote a job description for me one time in a talk. says, I get paid to write spaghetti code for a living. So it's awesome. Um, I'm a UX admin pro -tipper. It literally is like, it's got to run for 12 people for a usability study, and it never sees the light of day. Um, so, but I know in the real world, testing is important. They actually have a tool called Spectron, uh, which you can use to leverage and actually run proper unit tests with Mocha and Chai or whatever, and actually begin to test your application. Uh, which is probably rather important, especially if you start thinking about in fact, this is a desktop application. A lot more security starts to come into play because you have access to everything in here. You know, you can say, I'm going to erase your hard drive. You know, a lot of power, a lot of responsibility comes in writing an Electron app. And you want to make sure it's, it's working well. Um, real simple installation, boom. So let's talk about building your application. We'll get to some demos at the end. So you need to somehow sort of compile all these bits into something distributable, something that may go into the Mac App Store, the Windows Store, a, a server that looks and smells like a real application. The preferred tool is this module called Electron Builder. And really, it only takes a little bit of change to your setup so like I was mentioning earlier, that's why you kind of throw some stuff in the app folder. Like that, it's going to start writing stuff out to the build and distribution folder. It's a very well-maintained project. That's always that question you should ask yourself with any sort of open source tool. How well-maintained is it? You know, am I going to be hitting life you know, two months from now when a critical bug hits and I'm completely in trouble? So it's just nice to have a good maintained library. Um, it will build for all our platforms. It will build for our various architectures. So if you have to deal for, you know, back into 32-bit or 64, Mac, Windows, it will do all that for you. Basically, in that package JSON file, we need to update our scripts to basically tell it to run build, what we want to build for. And then we need to define a whole bunch of properties. These are actually very well documented. We have to give an app ID. Everyone needs an app ID. Um, that's how the world you know, keeps itself straight. Copyrights, you know, the name it's going to be, what elect version of Electron I want to package in there. Um, category, if I'm putting this in the App Store for Mac, where it's going to live. What kind of installer for Windows? Um, what I want to do for Linux, how I want to distribute there. App icons, et cetera, et cetera. All start to get, I put them all in here. Those are the things you start to define in here. If you've ever, like I said, if you ever worked with Cordova, this is sort of the equivalent of the config.xml file 
just they have to use JSON because it's not 10 years ago. So really, you know, you just basically have to point to where that new starter is. It's all good to go. Make your app icons in there. You have to go a little further. Like for the Mac, you know, you've probably have opened DMGs, disk images, and you've probably seen something, you know, really nice like this. You know, okay, like, hey, take this icon, this app, put it over here in this, you know, alias applications folder, and that's the extent of the installer. Well, you have to tell it where this graphic is, and how big it is, and what those things are. And it will create that DMG for you, make the zip, and there, there are your bits. Same thing with Windows. It will make your Windows installers. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to make a Windows installer, but oh, they're so much fun. Um, so it really does take a lot of the pain out of it. There are a couple variations on the two types of Windows installers out there, this or not. Um, but you get to define, this is the real simple one. You can have a more formal one, and you can start to define sidebar graphics and header graphics and make, make it look you know, like a, a real software developer knew what they were doing when they made this installer. It's really nice. Auto updating. This was a hard part. This was actually more interesting than I thought. I almost kind of feel like they got to the point where, like, oh, we just got to add it and move on. Um, it is built into Electron. However, the amount of additional work with the default Electron auto update system really left my head scratching because they're not even on top of the same worlds. So for Mac OS, it's going to use this system called squirrel.mac, which is different than the squirrel for Windows. And well, Linux actually, you're sorry, out of luck completely. But for the Mac one to work, you got to have your own server up and running, sending back a JSON file when requested to then send the update around and all this. Like I said, I'm a prototyper, I'm a front end guy. I'm like, what server? What? 200 response with what package? Oh, oh, please. Um, help me, help me. Um, so instead, there's a lovely alternative package out there called Electron Updater. And there's actually a, a sort of, what I call it, a third party group. Uh, it's Electron Userland, I believe. They actually have written quite a few. So that Electron Builder tool I mentioned earlier, it's the same group also has done this. Also done an Electron Forge, which we'll talk about in a second. This is an alternative to the Electron's built-in updater. And the nice thing is, it doesn't worry about the whole server response sort of stuff. So you just basically drop this in as a replacement and life is good again. So you pull in their auto updater, not Electron's, and then you can basically listen on to various events. It goes out to a URL, it asks some stuff, and then you check if there's an update, not update, download, an error. So you can have it do a silent install, a prompt install. So all that updating you see inside of really VS Code, stuff like that, it's all living on this. Much, much simpler than like standing up your own Heroku instance and uploading stuff and hoping you did it right and that sort of thing. So, but yeah, it is Electron User Land. They've also started another project, which I was just playing with toward the end of the book, this thing called Electron Forge, which is really an Electron CLI. It's almost a whole collection of tools to make all this even simpler. Um, it was just getting off the ground, so I'm like, oh, we don't want to rewrite the book. We're already late, so it was mentioned at the end. <laughs> so that's the book. Um, that's me. Let me show you some demos. All right. So make it a little bigger. So before I actually run this thing, so here's the package JSON file. You can see we're got a little test thing, got distribution in there, a few keywords, some more dev dependencies, build script type stuff. Let me just go ahead and run this. Oh, 
Jones, meet this one over. Hang on. Quit that. Wrong project. Oh, that's right. I moved it. That's what I get for cleaning up before I start. LFDRN. Um, you may have noticed that presentation I just gave you was Electron app. Actually, that was just Reveal.js that it really just dropped into the quick start, replacing the existing files, and was just an Electron app. So it literally is that easy to take a web app and slap it into Electron app. Now, I didn't do anything to deskify it. I don't know if that's a real word. Um, things like, you know, what with a keyboard, you know, putting up a proper menu, keyboard, saying, you know, Command H would do this, et cetera, et cetera. None of that was done, but it's literally as simple as it was. So here's Electron App. So those are the Chrome tools I was talking about right there. Um, I forgot to pull in the IPC render, but that's okay. Um, you know, I can pull up my, my dialog box. And then, you know, I can see what we have down here. I can choose a directory. All these things that I want. Test out my processes. There's, you know, console log back and forth. And this is all that code I was talking about through the presentation. So pull in the few modules. I basically go find the document, again, keeping it vanilla, and, you know, contextual menus. So if I come back over and control click, you know, I get a real contextual menu inside my HTML and do something with it. Click custom menu. Oh, there's my custom menu. Pulls that out. So, oh, and there's a reason why the buttons are purple. Look up Rebecca Purple. Um, but here are the things back and forth. Just what I was showing you the thing, I'll just simply put up inside the thing, inside there. Over in the main JS, you know, here's where I'm creating the window. You know, a little bit of the menus. You said the menus can get a little larger. This is where some of that uh, file management you know, loading in would be probably advantageous. Generate the icon, custom functions, and that sort of thing. So that is, you know, kind of the start of Electron. And here, let me show you what's possible. It's right there. So here's Ionic Generator. So we have that splash screen, and then here we have this application right here. This is an Electron application, and it's not in the App Store. It's signed to go that far. The UI actually is the Ionic framework. So even I've taken a mobile framework and actually pulled it into the desktop. So I have the ability to go through here and the idea is, if you've worked with Ionic, it comes with a, a CLI. I can never remember all the parameters. And it actually doesn't do everything that you would need to set up your Ionic application. Things like adjusting the manifest JSON file for a progressive web app, updating the config.xml file if you were deploying it to a native mobile app, pulling in the various plugins, the Cordova plugins. This actually was. I said, well, let's just play around with this. So I can go through and start to define my manifest JSON over here, come over to Cordova. Yeah, I know there's no platform. Start to pull in things, modifying splash screens, things I would do in a Cordova application. Yes, I know, I didn't pull it in. I can start having these scrolling lists, pulling in plugins. I can pull in uh, lock testing and eventually have it execute the CLI in the terminal on my user system. So I don't even paste it out like, no, no, copy this into a terminal. It would actually run and build my Ionic application all through a GUI. So if you have a bunch of command line tools lying around, you could actually write a UI making it a lot more friendly, a little more safeguards, and 
actually just use Electron to actually run those headless things for you and go from there. But that is a brief look at just, you know, just the top veneer of what Electron is, sort of a sampling of what the tools it can give you. The hard part is, you know, writing all the application logic, you know, to solve that for you. But it really gives you a nice other solution to take that web app, take that idea out of the browser, you know, where you probably had to say to your boss, oh, the browser won't let me do that, only a desktop can. Well, now you can. So with that, that is Electron. So I guess we can open up to some questions, if there are any. Hey, I'm VJ. Thanks for coming to the meetup today. I'm the organizer for JavaScript LA. I wanted to just personally thank you for watching this video. If you found it useful, I'd love for you to subscribe to our channel. We're slowly but surely making lots of little video content for you guys to enjoy and soak up, especially if you want to get better at programming. I'd love for you to be on our Slack channel too. Over 800 users. The link is right here, jsjoin, jsjo.in, if you forget. It's really simple. If you have questions for this meetup or you know questions you didn't get to ask or because you couldn't make it, uh, we'd love to have you just post it in our Slack group. So if you're a newbie, don't worry. It's a good place to go. There's a lot of great engineers all connected around LA and Orange County. So I hope to see you there.